Traditionally, physicians and financial managers haven't had a lot of love. Um, for the last four years, I've helped direct a nonprofit called Cost of Care that's tried to heal the rift. Um, and I think mostly why I'm here today is to tell you that at the cusp of 2014, not only are physicians increasingly willing to partner with financial managers, but for the sake of all of us, for our patients, for our institutions, for the system as a whole, we need to find new ways to merge our knowledge uh, in order to figure out the value of the care we're providing. So physicians are pretty quick to share the blame for the increased cost of health care with other parties. That's true. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're the ones who decide what goes on the medical bill. And that fact hasn't been lost on us. The overwhelming majority of us accept at least some responsibility for the rising cost of care. The problem is that we have very little idea in terms of what to do with that responsibility. And that's really where all of you come in. First of all, we need to be able to zero in on the margin of healthcare costs that physicians can really make a difference about. It turns out something like 700 to 900 billion dollars is spent every year on tests and treatments that don't help patients get better. So for people like me that decide what goes on the bill, that's kind of awkward. Um, you know, that's like the direct costs on the entire Iraq war. That's what we're dumping into tests and treatments annually that don't help patients get better. But, you know, Physicians are trained to take care of the patient in front of them. They're not trained to assume responsibility for populations. So we're smart, we understand that that's a huge number, but it seems very abstract to us. And then on top of it, a lot of healthcare costs are fixed. Just turning on the lights at the hospital is expensive. It's not my fault when I'm taking care of the patient in front of me that that costs money. Um, you know, a lot of care is patient demanded. So, you know, end of life care in the ICU is not low hanging fruit. That's probably not where we should start. That's how we got into the whole death panel thing. Um, and even if you give physicians a break on all of those costs, there's still well over $100 billion that we can directly return to the wallets of the American people just by making higher value clinical decisions. And increasingly, that's what the American public is going to demand from us. So this is Brigham and Women's Hospital, where I did my training in Boston. And as I walked around in this hospital over the last four years, the pressure on me to consider healthcare costs has come from two, dif two different directions. Um, it's come top down from policymakers who want more accountability in the way we're spending our resources. Um, you know, in, in that way, it's not that different from what happened in the early 90s. But what's different, I think, this time around is that it's also coming bottom up from patients who are demanding more transparency in the way I'm spending their money. Um, and I think that's what makes 2013 different. Now, this is true all over the country, but it's particularly true in Massachusetts. We're very proud that we were seven years ahead of the rest of the country in terms of covering everybody. Um, but now, you know, we're seven years ahead of the rest of the country in terms of running out of money to pay for it. <laughs> this is a picture of Martha Coakley, who's our Attorney General. And under her scrutiny, my healthcare system is actively cutting hundreds of millions of dollars out of our operating budget because we're deemed to be too expensive. And Apparently, many of your health systems are doing the same thing. So we're starting to feel the heat. We're also at the precipice of a radical shift in the way we pay for care. We're going from a system where if you add more line items to that bill, you make more money, to a system where if you add more line items to that bill, you may actually make less money. You've got a fixed budget, you're sharing the risk on overspending on that budget with the payer, and you have to, people like me, have to prove along the way that we're providing high quality care. And in my environment, you know, we're a pioneer ACO. That's probably the most visible example of this kind of um, reimbursement. But all three of the major commercial health plans have now converted to risk contracts. So we're starting to feel the heat. Most importantly, though, you know, health care is just eating up larger and larger shares of household budgets, rising at a rate of about 10% per year. And just because you cover everybody doesn't necessarily mean that you've made care more affordable. This is particularly relevant for January 2014. This is our experience in Massachusetts. We've covered 98% of our citizens. But since we did that, the rates of medical debt in Massachusetts actually haven't gone down. I mean, they're not rising at the astronomical rate that they're rising in the rest of the country, but they haven't gotten better. In fact, there are more insured non-elderly adults that are reporting difficulty paying medical bills than ever before. So how's that possible? How do you cover more people and 
somehow care is not only not more affordable, it might be less affordable. How is that possible? Shout it out. High deductibles, that's absolutely 100% right. See, this is like a very different audience for me. I'm used to talking to doctors. It's usually crickets. <laughs> High deductibles, because that's how you make you know, a plan on the exchange affordable. And the thing is, you know, of the 400,000 people that we added onto our insurance ledgers, the majority are on these kinds of plans. In January of 2014, when we do this across the nation, the amount of Americans on these sort of plans will probably double. And when you're taking the first five to $10,000 on the chin, um, you tend to become more price sensitive. So this is what we did in Massachusetts. There's a website called uh, My Healthcare Options. Right now, apparently they get like 10 hits a day and I'm five of them, but <laughs> I think that'll change. And w what this website lets you do, um, I don't know if Dan mentioned this, I'm actually an obstetrician, so this is what was interesting to me. You can look up specific tests by specific providers and then compare them in terms of cost and quality on this website. You can, anybody can generate these graphs. So this, these are three hospitals in Boston within a five mile radius of, of each other. And these are what the private plans are paying for first trimester OB ultrasounds. They're different. And the point is not whether or not this is inherently a good thing, it's just that it exists and it's, become, it's gonna become increasingly common, granular, accurate, and used. And it's not just Massachusetts, there's more than 30 states right now that either have legislation that's been passed or on the books to create similar options for patients. Um, you know, that Bain study that Dan mentioned came out not just because patients thought it was important, um, you know, what they picked up on was that physicians were starting to change their attitudes, um, largely because not, not only was there government spending on this, but there was huge private sector spending on this. That's why Bain was interested. Um, over the last three years, I've basically watched a cottage industry grow up around this idea of price transparency in healthcare. We use Yelp and Travelocity for every other purchasing decision in 2013. And there's an expectation that we ought to be doing the same thing for healthcare. So Castlight Health is probably the most visible. They have $200 million in their Series B funding to basically create a Yelp for healthcare. That's where things are going. And that's what it's gonna look like to be a physician in the very near future. In fact, in many ways, it's what it looks like to be a physician today. At some point, we're gonna to have to be able to consider costs while we're actively caring for patients. And the reason is gonna be because a patient has asked us to. And for most of us, you may as well blindfold us, spin us around, and ask us to pin the tail on a donkey. There was, um, there was a study in the Journal of Hospitalist Medicine relatively recently that asked hospitalists, these are people that spend all their time in hospitals, hence the name, to estimate the costs of the most commonly ordered tests. And they actually had to graph the results of their estimates on a log scale because they varied by an order of magnitude. The nerds in the room always laugh at that because they know what a log scale is. <laughs> Again, this is like talking to a finance grad. So what can you guys do to help us? Um, what can you do to help us make better decisions at the point of care? This in many ways maps directly to the prior talk, but you might think one thing that you could do is just tell physicians what things cost. I mean, when you're ordering off a menu that doesn't have any prices on it, it's really easy to get the filet mignon every time. Of course, that's easier said than done, but it's theoretically possible. You know, it turns out people don't really understand dollars and cents anyway, so Zagat figured out that if you give people $4 signs versus $2 signs, they can make a decision. You can at least probably do that. That's one opportunity. You might tell doctors what the evidence is. You know, the evidence says that this test, uh, you know, antibiotics, low value, don't do it. And both of those things, the prices and the evidence are important, but probably not sufficient. And here's why. For 150 years, physicians have known that hand washing saves lives. The evidence has been irrefutable, and until recently, we've been terrible at washing our hands. That might be a little disconcerting for some of you. <laughs> but we've gotten better at it relatively recently, and the way we got better wasn't by saying, here's the evidence behind hand washing that's existed for 150 years. It was by understanding the incentives to not wash our hands. You know, it turns out hand washing is inconvenient, and the consequences of not washing our hands are hard to see. And it was actually during my training that suddenly hand, sanit uh, hand uh, sanitizer was everywhere. 
It took a hand washing from a five minute operation to a 30 second operation. Um, we started to flag infections that were caused by the hospital. We created 360 degree feedback culture. So if I don't use the Purell at my hospital before walking into a patient room, the nurse will call me out on it. And if not the nurse, the patient will. And there's a similar opportunity in healthcare. So when we talk about you know, why it is that physicians knowingly overorder tests, the entire public discourse about this is about two things. It's about physicians trying to make more money in the fee-for-service model, or it's about physicians being concerned about medical malpractice. So at my medical center, and medical centers all over the country, all the tests are actually ordered by people that look like this. People like me six months ago, the residents. These guys are indentured servants. They are not making more money for ordering more tests. They're also relatively protected against medical malpractice. And yet academic medical centers are the most expensive places to get care in the United States, and they are rampantly over-utilizing tests. Why? Turns out when you dig a little bit deeper, there's 20 other reasons why physicians commonly over-order tests. And one of the biggest has to do with time. If I could order one test, wait for the result, and then order another, that's less good for me than to order five that I can think of all at once. Once you have a better understanding of the incentives, you need to develop good use cases for where you can leverage those incentives or modify them or make them better. So what we did is we asked physicians and nurses and patients to send us anecdotes, bedside level stories of routine opportunities to improve the value of care. The thing is, these are totally routine for us. You know, we got more than 300 from all over the country. We were able to get them into all the major uh, news outlets. We were able to hand them off to policymakers. And honestly, even as a person who was organizing this, I was surprised by how interested people were because for us, these were things that we saw every single day that just hadn't percolated into the public discourse. These are things like the daily lab orders that we order on patients every day. We know we do it and we never follow them. We don't even look for the results. We just get them because people are there. Once you've got the good use case, once you've got the incentives figured out, um, you can take the stuff that you guys know, that we don't necessarily know, and merge it with the things that we know. So here's one example, some of the work that we've started with uh, Atul Gawande. Uh, so it turns out that since 1970, the C-section rate in the United States has gone up by 600%. C-sections are now the most common major surgery in the United States. So one out of every three Americans is born through a major surgery. The majority of those C-sections, more than half, don't need to happen. In the entire delivery system, I think this is probably one of the most important problems that we have. And this trend line is inadequately explained by changing demographics. It's not explained by maternal preferences. It's not explained by medical malpractice policies. It's not explained by improved clinical outcomes. But once you get down into the weeds and you understand physician incentives, you know that you know, C-sections take people like me 30 minutes. And labor and delivery, for all of you guys who have kids, as you know, does not take 30 minutes. It'd be nice if it did, but it's a lot more work for us. It takes a lot more time. Um, so we have this theory that if physicians are feeling particularly busy, they might do more C-sections. Well, how do we figure that out? You don't go to the clinical data. You don't go to the charts, because the physician isn't going to write, you know, I'm feeling kind of busy. <laughs> what we did is we went to the administrative data and, you know, at the institutional level, and it turns out that, you know, our institution closely tracks things like when they have to pay nurses overtime because they got called in from home. Um, there's all kinds of information. It's just a wealth of information. You look at things like delivery to bed ratio, bed census, nurse to patient ratio. And all of a sudden, you've got dozens of proxies for how busy uh, the physicians are feeling. And then you can go to the clinical data, you can risk adjust it, and you can prove what's going on. It's pretty cool. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And here's the real opportunity, I think. You know, today, when physicians are ordering tests and treatments, they look like this guy over here. You know, they're sitting, they've got their smartphone, they've got their computer. When I want to order an MRI, I sit down at a computer and I click MRI. Uh, so there's a real opportunity, you know, over the last 20 years we've made patients a lot safer by embedding decision support 
uh, into our order entry system. So when a brand new resident you know, is ordering a test, it's actually pretty hard to hurt somebody. If you try to order a drug that a patient's allergic to, the computer will yell at you. It's like fairly easy to do. It's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to extend this idea to the idea of value. So selecting defaults. When somebody comes in with a cold, you know, the top five tests that pop up on your computer could be cleverly selected. Um, another thing that you could do is create forcing functions. So when I want to order an MRI that nobody needs, the computer could say, are you sure? <laughs> Ultimately, this is what we need to do. And this is why I'm optimistic that this is something that could be done, because this is not just an operational challenge for us. You know, we have to drive huge culture change. Um, and we've done it before. If I were to walk out onto the street right now and litter, a lot of people would give me the evil eye. Right now, if I go back to my hospital and I order an MRI that nobody needs, I'm not really sure who would bat an eye, but that's where we need to go. Uh, and to get there, we're gonna need your help. So, thanks so much.